everyone, Dr. Ken here with you again. We're going to be looking at lesson five, which is parallel AC circuits. And of course, with parallel, we're now going to be looking at current. So this is lesson five. We use chapter 18 of the textbook as the basis for these lessons. So let's get started. So about this lesson, uh, like a series circuit, a parallel circuit, often has inductance, resistance and capacitance, sometimes in various combinations. Therefore, the circuit current and the applied voltages are unlikely to be in phase. So we're going to be chasing out the phase relationships between currents and the applied voltage to a parallel circuit. So in this lesson, we're going to explain how to use phase and diagrams to find the total current in a parallel AC circuit. It's going to be very similar as far as the actual phase and diagrams are concerned, as in series circuits. It's phase difference to the applied voltage and the impedances of the circuit. And also this lesson we're going to describe what parallel resonance is by the time we get to the end. So this lesson I've broken up into effectively six sub-lessons. So it's lesson five, part one is the introduction, slides four to seven. Part two, parallel resistors and AC, slides eight to 11. Part three, inductors and resistors in parallel, or what we call L and R in parallel, slides 12 to 19. Part four, resistors and capacitors in parallel, slides 20 to 28. Can you see the pattern happening here? And then in lesson five, or part five, we're going to look at resistance, inductances, and capacitances in parallel. So we're building up layer upon layer. And then finally in part six, we're going to look at parallel resonance, slides 33 to 46. So in our introduction, in most electrical wiring installations, the appliances, lighting, machinery, and so on are all connected in parallel. That's the vast majority when we're looking at installations, our loads are typically connected in parallel rather than connected in series. So therefore, the uh, total load of the installation could include capacitors, resistors, and inductors connected together in different combinations, but still in parallel. Typically, each branch in the installation has combinations of capacitance, resistance, and inductances. And finally, it's therefore often convenient to see parallel circuits as having an impedance in each branch. So if we can deal with the impedance in each branch, then we can define the branch currents or the branch impedances and then work out the currents. So here we start with a parallel AC resistive circuit. And if you take special note, you can see here with the blue arrows, we've got the applied voltage. Then with a red arrow, we've got current total, IT is current total. And then we have two impedances. You notice they've used Z. We don't know what the impedances are made up from. But for now, two impedances, Z1, Z2. So we have a current I1 and a current I2. So a parallel circuit is made up of, in this case, two impedances. Voltage is common to both branches and each branch current is out of phase with the voltage. So the first thing we need to remember with parallel circuits is voltage now becomes the reference, and we're interested in how the currents shift in relation to each other and that reference. So here's a little exemplar, and we're actually gonna start with the diagram over here on the right hand side and you'll notice the colors have been maintained. So here we have a voltage V. We're not told what the voltage is in this particular case. 
We're told what the current I1 is through our impedance, so telling us it's 7 amps at 40 degrees lead. I2, the green one, 8 amps at 20 degrees lag. And then we have an I total in red. So in parallel circuit, total current and its phase angles are found with a phase diagram. Kirchhoff's law still applies. If you remember Kirchhoff's law, I've got my arrow there at the node. It says the sum of the currents into a node must equal the sum of the currents out of the node. But of course, these are complex quantities. They have both magnitude and they have angle. Therefore, they're a complex quantity. And then just to make things a little more difficult, remember our phasor diagram is still rotating in a anti-clockwise direction. There's my arrow going in an anti-clockwise direction. So we can add them, but we've got to add them using a phasor diagram because they're complex quantities. So you can see here now on the phasor diagram itself, you can see we have a scale. So one division equals one amp, nice easy scale. So let's do I1 to start with, and you'll notice it's 7 amps at 40 degrees. So we've put on here 7 amps is the magnitude, and it's 40 degrees lead, and it's lead in front of the reference, which is the voltage, the phasor in blue. Then we add on to our phasor diagram our 8 amps at 20 degrees lag. So here we have from here to here, the length is 8 amps and it's 20 degrees down from the horizontal because it's lagging the reference or the voltage. Then we can top to tail, so you can either take the orange phaser and top to tail it here where you can see my cursor and get to that point. Or you could top to tail the green phaser and put it up here and you'll come to the same place or you can do what I like to do and just use the parallelogram and measure off the green phaser put your compass on the top of the orange and draw an arc and then do the opposite for the orange phaser measure its length of the compass then put the tip of your compass on the end of the green one draw an arc with the two cross is that point so that point there represents the I total. Remembering, of course, you've got to project it backwards to the origin, which is back here, and the length of the red phaser is the total current. Its distance from the horizontal, either positive or negative. In this particular case, it's positive angle, therefore it's a lead. We end up with a total current of 13 amps because we've just scaled it off the phase of the diagram and we've got our protractor out and we've measured 7.8 degrees and that's given us the angle in here. So for our phase of diagram we end up with the red line I total leads the supply voltage by 7.8 degrees at 13 amps. So here's the general procedure. And this one's worth writing down in your notebooks as we go through it. These five simple steps. Number one, calculate the impedance of each branch. They may give you the impedance of the branch. They may give you the inductance. Or they might give you the capacity of reactance and you've got to work it out. But at the end of the day, step one is calculate the impedance of each particular branch. Then calculate each branch current, where the branch current equals the supply voltage divided by the branch impedance. Remember, the voltage is the same across all branches because the voltage is common in a parallel circuit. Three. Find the phase angle for each branch current by using either trigonometry, if we've got enough information available, or by using a phase diagram. Remember, our phase diagram would have to be to scale, 
if we're going to scale off the right lengths and the correct angles. Fourth, find the total current and its phase angle to the supply voltage within the phasor diagram. And then finally, calculate the total circuit impedance by dividing the total current into the supply voltage. Okay, so this last step may sound simple, and it is just Ohm's law. So to calculate the impedance of the whole circuit, you simply divide the total current, that's the I total, divided by the supply voltage will give you the impedance for the total circuit.